Oh, yeah. What we're going to do um, before we get into the meat of the PETS presentation, we're going to give some background about OVR so that um, if you're not familiar with what all OVR does, you'll have a little bit of background information and, um, and how all the offices are um, sorted throughout the state. Um, OVR's mission statement, we assist Pennsylvanians with disabilities to secure and maintain employment and independence. Um, if you go into... Can you click back? Yeah. Sorry. If you go into um, the live website or into the PowerPoint, um, those are actually links that you can click on to um, get connected to Facebook and LinkedIn. Okay, some overview services of OVR. Um, on the vocational rehabilitation services, we have early reach initiative. And um, actually, Sarah Vogel, our early reach specialist, she will be presenting the next session. I think it's C12. Um, she'll be doing, a, um, it's a game of life. So um, youth, I would encourage you to attend that session. Um, some other services is the pre-employment transition services, diagnostic services, vocational evaluation, counseling and guidance, re restoration services, vehicle and home mods, and then also we have some additional services um, for the blind and visual services, blindness skills training, instruction in mobility and daily living, um, living skills, um, specialized children services, and adult. So how is OVR broken down? Well, OVR, we are a state agency. We're under the Department of Labor and Industry. And under that, we have, OVR has um, several bureaus that follow under that. So we have the Bureau of Vocational Rehab Services, which we have 15 district offices throughout the state. We have the Bureau of Blind Visual Services, which we have six district offices throughout the state. Um, Hiram G. Andrews Center, also the Commonwealth Technical Institute out in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And then Bureau of Central Operations, which is in Harrisburg. How OVR is organized, um, each office, no matter if they are part of BVRS or BBVS, uh, they will have a district administrator, an assistant administrator, and clerical support and supervisors, and also um, vocational rehab counselors. Then the difference with BVRS, the um, Bureau of Vocational Rehab Services, they will also have business service reps. Um, they would have early reach and early reach coordinators. And then for the um, BVS side, the blind visual services side, they would have um, vocational rehab therapists, um, occupational mobility specialists, and social workers. Okay, here's a map of where we're all spread out. And then we're broken out into um, different regions. So these are the different district offices throughout the, the state, um, based into Western, Central, and Eastern. And then the presenters, um, I'm Melissa Wirt-Thrush. I am the Central Region Transition Specialist. And also my um, specialty area, besides being the Central Region, I'm the statewide coordinator for Project Search. And I'm also the OVR um, coordinator for the Transition Conference. And then my co-presenter is Caitlin Savati. Um, she is the Eastern Region Transition Specialist. She oversees the College Policy, um, A Achieve Program, and am I missing anything? <laughs> and here's regional contacts. Um, also, I'd like to introduce Beth Ann, if you can wave your hand. Beth Ann is our Western Region Specialist. Her specialty is also supported employment, and she does the CTP programs. And right beside her is our Division Chief, Kim Robinson. She oversees all of us. Um, I encourage everybody, again, this is part one, but part two, um, both of them will be presenting. It is um, session D5 from 345 to 445. And what they'll be capturing on is supported employment, section 511, and also post-secondary services. 
Okay, so the information in this presentation is on a statewide level. If you attend some of the other OVR sessions, they may be more geared to a local level, but um, this because we um, are we, do, we are specialists for a statewide level, that, um, that's what this is going to um, focus on, but we will have some examples of local programs too. So in this pr presentation, our objectives is to provide a definition, background of pre-employment transition services, explain OVR's role in the transition process, describe the difference between potentially eligible and eligible customers, explain how PETS impacted by the order of selection. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin now. All right, so we are just gonna start with a review of our pre-employment transition services. Hopefully nothing crazy new um, if you've heard about pre-employment transition services previously, um, but it's always just a good place to start, review, and refresh everybody. Um, so these services, yes, yeah, sorry, you can click the next one. These services help students with disabilities learn about themselves, understand work requirements, practice work skills, choose a career, and explore training options. When we talk about um, pre-employment transition services for students. In order to participate in these services, students must meet kind of this general definition of a student with a disability. And that's really just to be between the ages of 14 and 21 years old. So you have to be at least 14 and then all the way through the age of 21. You have to be enrolled in secondary, so high school or post-secondary training, um, college, any type of post-secondary training program. And you have to have an IEP, a 504 plan, or just identify, the student has to identify themselves as having a disability. So as long as a student meets that definition, it's pretty broad and generic, so it's not too hard. Um, as long as they meet that definition, then they're gonna fall into one of two categories as it relates to OVR. So traditionally with OVR, uh, before you could start or receive any services, you had to apply and open a case and be found eligible. And then you can start in all our VR services. When it comes to pre-employment transition, these services can be taken advantage of for our students considered potentially eligible. So they do not have yet to have applied to OVR. Um, they just have to meet that definition of being a student with a disability. Um, and they are considered potentially eligible for OVR and they can participate in these services. Um, so potentially eligible captures all those students that meet that definition but have not applied to OVR or if they're in the, in the process of opening a case but they haven't been determined eligible yet. And then we have our second category of eligible students. So they have applied to OVR and they've been found eligible for not just pre-employment transition services but then further VR services. All right. So when we say pre-employment trans transition services, that gets thrown around a lot. If you were at the keynote speaker this morning, she also did a nice review of this. So <laughs> hopefully you already heard that. And then again, this won't be new. But we're really talking about five categories of services. These are self-advocacy instruction, counseling on post-secondary options, job exploration counseling, workplace learning, and workplace readiness training. So anything that we do, any service that we do, has to fall under one of these five categories to be considered PETS. So I'm going to quickly break down these five categories, the definition, and then kind of some of the services that we're providing that fall under each of these. So starting with self-advocacy self instruction, this service really helps students with disabilities build skills to solve problems and communicate their own needs and interests. These, this can typically occur one-on-one -on -one in individual counseling with a VR counselor or in group presentations in school or community settings. And these topics are gonna include disability awareness and disclosure, relationships and boundaries, yeah, <laughs> decision-making, setting goals, self-care and wellness, self-advocacy, determination, accommodations and assistive technology, and student-led IEP and transition meetings. The next one is the counseling on post-secondary options. 
And this service really helps students with disabilities decide if college or training after high school is right for them. So again, it's gonna be that more one-on-one -on -one counseling or in the group presentations. Topics can include post-secondary training options, so just what is out there. Um, we're talking about college or different um, technical schools, anything that could be open to a student. Uh, financial aid and or FAFSA, how do you apply for these? Um, ac academic accommodations, learning style and study skills, college resources, the differences between high school and college, specifically um, how you go about getting accommodations, the IEP versus what you have to do in college, um, college events and how to fill out a college application. So the next one is job exploration counseling. This broad category is focused on helping students with disabilities learn about jobs and pick a career. Um, again, this is gonna happen mainly in that one-on-one -on -one counseling or the group presentations. And it goes over career overviews and pathways, in-demand careers, vocational interest inventories, non-traditional employment, um, labor market information, so learning about the career that you're interested in. Is it growing in your area? Are you gonna have to move if you choose this career in order to find a job? Um, and does it, is that career expected to continue growing or having a positive outlook? Um, employment requirements, what do you need to do? What kind of training and skills do you need to do to have this job? Um, job fair facilitation, informational interviews, and career speakers. All right, work-based learning um, is slightly different than the other ones as it involves using community workplaces to provide students with disabilities the knowledge and skills that will help them connect school, ex school experiences to real life work activities and future work opportunities. So this is going to be more going out into the community and getting some hands-on learning experience. Um, so examples under here include our project search, which not my specialty area, so I'm not gonna attempt to define that. <laughs> you can ask Melissa about that at the end if you need more information. Um, but there is job shadowing, so just being able to go out into a work environment and shadow somebody that is in a career that you're interested in, seeing what their day-to-day -day life looks like. Um, and paid work experiences. So we work with a lot of students to get them into, these are temporary work experiences typically, um, but just to go out and get paid for a job and see what the demands are of employers when you are getting paid to do a job and what it feels like to get paid for work and then how you can use that money. And then the last category is workplace readiness training. Uh, and so again, that's going back to more of that one-on-one -on -one counseling or the group presentations. And workplace readiness training is really about teaching students how to get and keep a job. Um, we probably do the most trainings in this area, I believe. Um, it's, there's a lot that falls under um, this topic, as you can see. And it also includes our independent living skills, um, those types of trainings. Um, so this can involve anything from applications and interviews, um, problem solving, time management and organization, communication skills, how do you talk to your coworkers and your supervisor, how do you request time off, what's the most appropriate way to go about some of these conversations, um, teamwork, having to work with your coworkers, basic computer skills, um, I think most jobs, if you saw me struggle <laughs> as we were getting set up, most jobs involve having to use a computer in some capacity. Um, professionalism, professionalism and hygiene, what's expected of you when you show up on a job, networking, uh, budgeting and finances, daily living skills, photo ID and records. Um, you can't just take your school ID to go apply for a job, so how do you go about getting the proper documentation? Um, safety, including internet usage, we do a lot of that. Um, navigating social services, transportation methods, how are you going to get back and forth to your job? It's great that you've got something set up, now how do we get there? And that also inv involves group travel training. All right, back to Melissa for special programs. Okay, the first one is Project Search. Um, Project Search was founded in 1996 
by the um, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. Um, it is a one-year internship that happens the last year that the student would be in high school. So typically between that 18 and 21 year, whenever they're um, getting ready to exit out. Um, typically, the sites are at a healthcare. Um, it could be at a hospitality place. Um, or a government site. Currently, right now in Pennsylvania, we have 17 um, student sites. We have four adult sites. Um, the breakdown of the student sites, we have four in the western area of the state, and they are all at a hospital. In the central region, we also have four sites. Those two are all at a um, hospital setting. In the east, we have nine sites. Um, they are at hospitals. We have one at a pharmaceutical company and also at Kalahari Resort and Convention Center in the Poconos. And um, tomorrow, from 1 to 2, session G9, um, that is going to be a presentation on the Lancaster General Hospital Project Search site. They're actually um, just celebrated 10 years. So if anybody wants to know anything more about that particular site or even Project Search in, in general, I would encourage you to attend that tomorrow. Another program, and now this one is a local program, it's called YOLA, Youth On-Site Learning Opportunities, and this is based out of the Newcastle District Office, and it's a collaboration between OVR, um, Community College of Allegheny County, and the YMCA camp. Um, actually, they're doing a presentation right now as we speak. They're over in room um, 205. Um, some things that they do in that particular training program is in, it's in food service, environmental jan janitorial, in outdoor building maintenance, healthcare professional. Um, each student will receive a total of 72 hours of hands-on training, 56 hours of once specific industrial training and 16 hours of soft skills training over a four week period. Um, another local program is out in Pittsburgh. There's um, three that I'm gonna mention. Um, one is the FedEx Package for Success. It is a six week paid work experience. Potential for hire in a high demand job. Another one is My Municipality Youth Work Initiative. It's Students work in a variety of jobs in their own or neighborhooding municipality, 500 and plus summer work experiences to date. Um, another one is My Work Pittsburgh. City students obtain work experience in numerous departments, pools, senior centers, et cetera, and lead to summer and permanent work placements. Um, another shout out I want to give, um, the Pittsburgh office is going to be presenting tomorrow from 9.15 to 10.45 on um, session E11, Embedded Inclusion Model. So that's a collaboration with Pittsburgh OBR and Giant Eagle. And Caitlin is going to talk about order of selection. So I did just want to highlight, since we're talking about those special programs, you can see it's not always just that one-on-one -on -one counseling or going into a, you know, a group um, presentation in a school. Um, our offices are really trying to go out and get work experiences for students in the community, try and get out there as much as possible. Um, and again, really connecting that what we're learning in school and what we're learning in some of those group presentations to how this applies on the job and in the community. Um, so that's why we did want to highlight some of those programs. You can see some of the different things going on across the state. So now I have the fun job of talking about the order of selection. Um, if you are not aware, OVR has officially closed down the order of selection starting July 1st, so just at the beginning of this month. Um, I'm going to talk about what that means, what order of selection is, um, and then how that could have a potential impact on our students. Um, so first I'm going to start just explaining order of selection. Uh, I didn't really know what it meant before I came to OVR, so I don't expect you guys to. Um, so basically, if a vocational rehabilitation aids agency is unable to serve all eligible individuals, the state must put into place an order of selection. We have been on an order of selection 94. since 1994. I didn't have the date to write in. <laughs> um, so basically that means once, um, once a person applies for OVR and you go through the eligibility process and you are hopefully determined eligible for services, you are placed into one of three categories. 
Um, and those three categories are most significantly disabled, significantly disabled, or not significantly disabled. Um, so that's our order of selection is those three categories. Um, and basically, it's meant to assess and triage an individual's needs and then prioritize services based upon that level of need. Um, so since 1990, when did we close down the last two? Uh, I should have asked this before, sorry. Um, I think it happened in 94 when we did it. A couple of periods where they have opened up the mm -hmm. categories of uh, significantly disabled mm -hmm. and not Mm -hmm. um, we also had some extra state funding along the year. So you've seen, um, you've seen kind of some various, um, what's the word of, various parts of this, mm -hmm. um, but we actually haven't had those other categories open mm -hmm. uh, for, a, for a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, again, sorry, I'm trying to remember to use the mic <laughs> and repeat um, what Kim was saying is that since we did implement the order of selection in 1994, um, those last two categories, the significantly disabled and non significantly disabled, have been closed um, on and off. Like I said, we did get some funding at certain times to be able to open up those again. Um, but really, since 1994, the most significantly disabled category is the one that um, we've been serving the longest. The longest. Thank you. Um, so in, in an order of selection, individuals, again, with the most significant disabilities will be selected first for the provision of vocational rehabilitation services. Um, so the big change that happened July 1st is that now all categories are closed. So after an individual is determined eligible for OVR services, they are then placed onto a waiting list. Next one. Um, so how is this impact or how is this closed OOS going to impact our students? Um, Basically, for IEP meetings, OVR staff will still be able to attend IEP meetings for our potentially eligible students. So again, that's all our students in a high school that meet that definition of a student with a disability. Um, and for any students that have an open VR case um, during this time. So it's really not gonna impact our ability to be in the school and be at those IEP meetings, talk about what we can do in pre-employment trans transition services and OVR services. And, how that process would then look. Um, and then go, going a little bit further into the pre-employment trans transition services, I'm going to explain this the best I can. It took me a couple <laughs> read-throughs to understand it myself. So if you have questions, please feel free <laughs> to ask them at the end. Basically for our pre-employment transition services, if you are a potentially eligible student, you are a student in high school, you have not yet applied for OVR services, um, you can still receive all pre-employment transition services, so that's not impacted. If you are a student that has applied for, um, for OVR, and we're kind of going through that process of completing your application and determining your eligibility, you can still receive all those pre-employment transition services. Once your eligibility is determined and you're placed on a waiting list, as long as we know that you have participated in any one of those PETS, you've had a pre-employment transition service before you were put on that waiting list, again, you're fine. You can continue to receive any and all pre-employment transition services. There's only one really specific category that might be impacted, and that's on that last slide. And that's going to be for our students that have applied for OVR services, been determined eligible, and are on the waiting list but we have no record of them having received any pre-employment transition services before they were on that waiting list. Um, then they're kind of stuck there and they can't receive any PETS going forward. So in order for us to know that a student has participated in pre-employment transition services, we've been working with schools for the past couple of years now to get those release forms signed for OVR so that way we can kind of capture that basic data on the student and then keep track of what services they're participating in. Our providers that are going into the school and doing these group sessions, um, they are doing the same thing. They're getting those um, 
release forms signed, and then when they're billing, we're knowing what students um, have participated in what services. So my advice would be <laughs> is if you have a student or if you are a student and you are applying for OVR, during that process of applying for OVR and before your eligibility is determined, make sure you're talking to your OVR counselor um, and seeing if they can find a record of you having participated in any pre-employment transition service up until this point. And if not, look to amend that. See what you can get involved in again, any one of the services before your eligibility is determined. So it's really just that one small category of students that could be impacted. Um, but other than that, pre-employment transition services are up and running. We're still gonna be in the schools. Um, so the impact, the closed order of selection really isn't gonna have a huge impact, hopefully, on the majority of our students. So I talked very fast <laughs> and we have plenty of time for questions again we're going to have two or one mics going around so please again we're being recorded we want to make sure we capture all these questions so we're going to come around with the mics um and we got questions in the back so if you want to give her the other one and then to the back we got lots of questions I also just wanted to note um, with order selection we understand that, that it's a lot of information it's a you know it can be complicated there will be uh, public webinars as well on order of selection yeah. mm -hmm. um, they are posted in the transition conference materials yeah. um, there's one um, that's being run through the office of developmental programs and we're going to focus on order of selection and how uh, how we're collaborating, collaborating with ODP during this time, uh, and then there is also uh, a, web, a webinar that is that focuses just on uh, the general order of selection, mm -hmm. and it's intended for the public. That one is happening on July the 31st. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, all that all that information is included in the packet of materials mm -hmm. if you want to know more about order of selection. Yep. Uh, and you can also go to our website. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a, power, a full PowerPoint on order selection there, as well as an FAQ document, um, which we're updating as we're getting more questions from the public and, and from our staff. Mm -hmm. So hi. hi. My question um, yeah, for you is mm -hmm. two, twofold. One, I have a student, I have a son with autism, and we did go through OVR before all of this is going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he has an OVR counselor now. Mm -hmm. How does this impact him? That's the first question. The second question is, I work in a disabilities office or accessibilities office. I have students that come to me on a regular basis, and one of the things that we provide in our packet is the OVR um, brochure. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, when I have parents come through, they would say anything to me now that it's like six months. This is prior to this. Mm -hmm. So what's, how, how do I, ex what explanation may or may not be able to be given to the parents and should we be giving out OVR brochures? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start with question number one. Uh, so it's going to depend on, um, you know, for each individual person, if you had a plan in place, a plan for employment that you had filled out with your OVR counselor, um, and that was in place before that July 1st um, deadline, then you are, good to continue with OVR services. I'm sorry, completely misstating that when going over the order of selection. Um, so if you already have a plan in place, you are good to continue. Um, and also I wanna add, mm -hmm. um, you can have amendments done too. So if mm -hmm. they have a, an IPE in place, but there's an additional service that is needed, um, as long as they have that original IPE, you can do an amendment. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask one more question in there too? I forgot the C. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, can you use the mic? Can you use the mic? Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is there still trans transition money built in there for individuals with um, autism? Because at some point in time, we were understanding that through OVR, there was like this fork in the road almost. Students wanted to go to college, and this is where my son was. Mm -hmm. He needed to fill out X and Y paperwork and get FAFSA and all, FAFSA and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And there was monies available to go to college. Is that fork still there? So that is, we do support training 
post-secondary training for our customers, um, it's almost like it's just an additional service that we can add on to that plan for employment. Um, but yes, we do still require customers to complete their FAFSA and then it's kind of, it's a financial needs test almost. So it's based on financial need. Um, and we are gonna talk a little bit more about that actually in part two of our I'm section, sorry. but you can also just come and we can talk about that more too. Okay. But I did wanna go back to that second part of your question. Um, like Kim had stated that on our website, we do have um, a brochure on the closed order of selection and how um, our services are impacted by that. So I would still recommend giving out uh, the OVR brochure. You're gonna wanna get um, signed up and applied and on the waiting list at this point in time. And then we can also hand out that secondary brochure of the closed order of selection um, and what that looks like how our customers are impacted and then when they're going to talk to their OVR counselor you know again going through that information but already having those two brochures to be able to take with them to that meeting will be helpful so good uh, the other thing I would mention I believe we have order of selection brochures at our resource table as well oh yes um, they are downstairs pick up. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, you would you would need to print them, I believe, from the website. So yeah, they're they're in PDF form. Mm -hmm. um, so we are closing the order of selection effective July the first. Um, mm -hmm. Our intent is to review our financial resources at every quarter mm -hmm. um, to determine if we can open that list and let individuals uh, let individuals through off of that waiting list. So it is important. It is still important to apply for OVR services so that you're on that waiting list. Yeah, in the beginning, you had mentioned um, job shadowing. We were under the uh, impression that that was a service that's no longer available. Are they doing job shadowing or not? Because they told us that job shadowing was no more. Nope. Nope. That Is that like, does each office make those decisions? Because that's what we were told. Uh, job they shadowing is, is to remain a service, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, out of it the could maybe be dependent on the, the availability office? of providers. But the, mm -hmm. it, is, it is a service huh. we, we plan to maintain. Okay, because they told us not to expect any more that it was something they were discontinuing. Okay, no. you may want to follow up with me afterwards. Would, would local district offices have different, at that time they might have not had the funds for it? Are you good? Okay. <laughs> um, I might not word this correctly, but in mm -hmm. our area, typically how the process is for receiving PETS services for the individualized service is that the counselor meets with the student, does the intake, but determines eligibility before authorizing a PETS service. Mm -hmm. So how you explained if someone applied for OVR and is going through the application process to determine eligibility, they can still receive PETS, but mm -hmm. how our office does it because they don't get PETS until their eligibility has been determined, so therefore that would exclude okay. any right. new student. We want to follow up on that, yeah. but they can't, I mean. Well, I know they can, can but the, uh, that's not how eligible, that office. And they're going to have to okay. receive as So they'll change eligible. their process for. So yes, okay. so it will. Can, do you mind telling me what office you're in? Philadelphia. Oh, it's, it's Philly, <laughs> and I may be misunderstanding their process okay. from how I've talked to there counselors, are, but my understanding yeah. is that Eligibility is determined first, and another provider mm -hmm. backs. Okay. Use your mic. The difference between an open case and eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, an open case means that they've completed an application for services. That doesn't necessarily mean that they've been determined eligible yet for services. Mm -hmm. And students can still receive pre-employment transition services uh, with it with that open case with the application. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, okay. and I, and certainly, like there are definitely reasons why moving towards eligibility very quickly can be a benefit. But within order of selection, some of that, some of those processes may have to be looked at and revised. Yeah. I think you just answered my question, but <laughs> um, and I'm glad she went first. But I, my question, I guess, is I'm a, I'm a teacher in a small district, and I heavily rely on OVR as far as. Um, because we don't have a lot of career, so I mean, I do some career training and some, uh, I take kids out and, and do some community-based vocational instruction, but um, 
So as far as the pre-ETS goes, before they apply um, and get waitlisted, I want to get them involved with like my early outreach coordinator to do some other. So that should be my goal, like this school district or the school year getting into the pre-ETS before they apply, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so just to expand on that as well with, mm -hmm. this, with the early reach um, coordinators mm -hmm. in the school. So it's going to be a prerequisite to have participated in a PETS group program before you're mm -hmm. eligible for an open case. Is that my understanding, or, really or you know, or it helps you if you've mm -hmm. not had any pets and you try to make an application, mm -hmm. then you get on a wait list right away. But if you have had group services or through early reach, mm -hmm. then that gives you a better chance. Is that my understanding? I'm not sorry. A better, you can just continue to receive pre-employment transition services. So it just has to be any one of those services. So it could be a group presentation that's either done by one of our providers um, or by our early reach coordinators coming into the schools. Um, or it could be have been like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a VR counselor at some point. Um, so it really just has to be any t one of those pre-employment transition services, and then they can apply. They're not, the designation doesn't come in until their eligibility is determined. So there is that process of applying and filling out paperwork where they can still be getting in those pre-employment transi transition services, I cannot say transition anymore, <laughs> um, in. <laughs> and it's really once that eligibility determination is made, then, and they're put on a waiting list, again, as long as they've received one PETS of any sort before being put on that waiting list, they can continue to receive all PETS. Okay, and group services then are going to be continuing more mm -hmm. so in the school because of the new mandate, the new... Um, I mean, as much as possible, as much as our early reach coordinators are getting out there. And again, we still have, um, you know, our contracts with our providers that are going out and doing PETS. So if you don't feel like you have enough going on in your school, then definitely reach out to your local office and talk about, you know, how we can get that going and make oh. sure our students are served. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. One thing that I will mention, too, um, mm -hmm. we're not, with order of selection in VR services, we're not allowed to prioritize uh, any specific mm -hmm. group. So participating in PETS is simply a caveat to being able to continue participating in PETS. It has no impact on your ability to continue in VR services or move faster in the waiting list. Yeah, we're not, we're not allowed to make any designation. So I have um, two questions. Uh, when are we receiving the new bulletin that was to come out on the first? Bulletin uh, was released on July the, it was July the 1st by ODP, and our OVR staff also received the bulletin uh, by email as well within the week, the same week. Mm -hmm. okay. Providers have not received that. Oh, the, uh, the provider agreement? Are you talking about the, the provider bulletin? agreement or the joint bulletin? The bulletin. The oh, bulletin? Okay. Um, are you part of so, ODP's listserv? Yes, but we received uh, the joint bulletin addressing what's going to happen for mm -hmm. uh, human service uh, or, or uh, mm -hmm. pre-employment, mm -hmm. but it wasn't it wasn't the same as what we received um, uh, the first bulletin from just OVR. Okay, so we can we can definitely look into that and in, in sending it out to our stakeholder list. Um, it, the jo the bulletin addendum did go out on the ODP's li public listserv. And you said it was on the on the website. On the website. On your website. So no, I'm not sure if it's on the okay. OVR website, but I can check. Um, so my second question is then, what has changed with how funding is going to be dispersed um, as far as um, you know, uh, rural uh, areas receiving no um, pets money compared to urban areas where students are, same students are receiving multiple services? Um, so how is, how is that changing? <laughs> I'm going to toss that one to you, Kim. <laughs> um, so you're saying that rural districts are not getting as much P as much services as rural areas, as urban areas. Um, 
I think that's another question to follow up with me on. I, I would mm -hmm. like to know some more specifics about that situation. Um, Those were all questions and for, for comments mm -hmm. from the bulletin. I will also mention, and for those of you that may not know, I just had a baby, and this is only my <laughs> third week back, so I'm still, still processing yeah. and learning some of this as I go. Mm -hmm. So be kind. I'm still, yeah. still in a little bit of a baby mode. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. lie. Yeah, I mean, and it, and it might just be to, uh, you know, getting our staff, our early reach coordinators, and providers. I mean, we're constantly, um, especially in those areas that we know are underserved, working, trying to get more providers signed up to do PETS services with us. Um, so again, just reaching, reach out to us and see who else we can get signed up um, to help serve those areas, because keep filling out those providers agreements. <laughs> um, I would say too that what PETS are provided in any particular school district is a collaboration with that school district and what they want and mm -hmm. what they need and what they allow us to go in and do. So um, I wouldn't say from my experience that rural areas in general are underserved and the cities are super served. Um, that, that hasn't been what I've seen across the state as a rule. But it certainly, like they're saying, if there's an area where you have seen that, you're a provider of PETS services, um, definitely have a discussion with us about that. So. Um, so now I'm on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. How long do you anticipate I have to wait? Is there somewhere I can go and look to see if I'm next? Do you have any sense of this? Yes. So we are not certain we're not certain of how long that that we're going to be on a closed order of selection we are going to evaluate our financial resources every quarter so that's your your typical quarters october january april july um, to determine if we can open the order of selection and let a, a group of individuals on the waiting list uh, through to develop plans uh, the website will be updated when that happens um, it's going to it's all based on your um, excuse me, your eligible application date. Date of application, date of application. Date you, yeah. The date you sign the roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, that's the, the final page of the application, yep. Go ahead. Wait, there's, we're going with the microphone. <laughs> so uh, could you explain to me what the role OVR plays in project search? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> OVR's role in Project Search is we are a partner. Um, typically, the partners are the host business, um, education. And again, I'm, I'm talking about just the student sites. I'm not talking about the adult sites. Um, MHID, um, OVR, and um, community agencies, um, like a jo job. We don't call it job coaching in Project Search. We call it job skills trainer. So what OVR does is we, um, Project Search is based on um, six payment points. It's three rotations that the students go through. Um, OVR pays the job skills trainer um, for those, those six payment points. Yep. Yeah, Project Search is really, really is a collaboration between OVR, the school district, uh, and MHID system. Um, so each, each partner actually has a role. Yeah. Uh, in that process, so we, we are all collaborating um, and braiding our funding. I just wanted to follow up with her question. So um, I'm one of the presenters who will be presenting with Project Search tomorrow, um, and I'm from OVR. I serve for the Lancaster County, um, and I serve as the liaison for Project Search. So one of the um, one of the situations that I do is I meet with all of the students, get to know them. I'm also a part of the steering committee meetings. Um, so not only getting to know the students, but to come together with all of the teams that's involved as a collaborative, collaborative um, effort to talk to them about different um, things that we can do to assist the students while they're at the hospital. Um, so not only do we just pay for a different funding, but we also is there to support the students and also talk about appropriate conversations to have during when they're at the hospital, when they're not at the hospital, um, how to dress, different things like that. So we're still involved during that whole process. And one thing I do want to add with Project Search, um, individuals that go through Project Search has to have an open case with OVR. Can you talk a little bit about the transition from the OVR services for students versus 
adult. Um, my daughter's 21. She's now been moved to adult services. And it just doesn't seem like there's the same range of opportunities offered through OVR anymore. So can you just speak to that a little bit? I mean, um, services aren't, don't change. It's just um, probably since we've hit that 20, is she over 21 now? And is she in, in Oh, when she graduated from higher. Sorry, I know her. <laughs> um, um, so now it's it's more that she's really no longer eligible for pre-employment transition services anymore, and she's just on the VR track. Um, so that is probably one of the bigger areas that we're seeing the difference. Um, but we don't really, other than having that designation of the pre-employment transition services, um, all other customers just receive that VR, our, all our VR services, um, which we did talk about way at the beginning. Um, but also, again, downstairs at our table, we have our brochures that list those a little bit more specifically. Um, so that might be where we're seeing the big difference. Uh, I know yeah yeah and unfortunately um, I don't we didn't set the age age limits of 14 to 21 we're following federal law on that one um, but definitely if again if you are seeing that gap and still seeing that need for more services talk to your talk to your OVR counselor and see what else I mean if we can't provide it let's talk about what other agencies maybe we can get involved that can so. yep yep turnover is also an issue so there's there's a lot of battles <laughs> I appreciate you continuing to fight for your daughter <laughs> hi I do have another question and this has to do with older um, mm -hmm. students that come to me specifically veterans so if we are working with them, and a lot of times we will say to them, are you involved with OVR? Have you got, no, we haven't. Are they going to also be put on the wait list? Is that for everybody? Mm -hmm. Or if you, it is for everybody. For everybody. The wait yes. list is for all, all, all VR services, yes. Okay, so it's not just the high school population. Correct. That's coming out of high school transitioning. And my other question um, was, if you are somebody who, had OVR services mm -hmm. and then for whatever reasons need to come back again, is that going to be on the wait list too? Mm -hmm. Depends on the time frame. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I did want to just do a shout for the veterans. Uh, the VA does have their um, own vocational rehabilitation program too. It's the federal program. Um, so you can look them up too <laughs> for our veterans. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Good day. I have a question about the work-based learning experience. Will it still be 40 hours paid employment? Um, yes. I believe at this point we have no change. We are that. still in the midst of <laughs> evaluating and, and, and determining our, our next steps uh, with me being on maternity leave and our new support, our new executive director being appointed. We're still, we're still figuring out all of that. I just became aware. <laughs> it's wonderful news. So um, you, you will determine whether or not 40 hours would be the maximum. Is an individual permitted to have a second experience prior to graduation, or is there only one WBLE prior? So again, that is, that is something that we are discussing um, as, part of, as part of looking at our financial resources and, and determining our next steps with mm -hmm. pre-employment transition services. And then the last question, the provider of the PETS services, can that be a teacher or a transition consultant? Or must it be an employee of OVR? No, so we do have a PETS provider agreement. Mm -hmm. So anybody outside of OVR that wants to provide these services would have to complete that agreement. Um, so it doesn't just have to be, I mean, mostly it's our supported employment providers, mm -hmm. since we already had a connection with them, or the ones that kind of really were on the ball with filling out those PETS provider agreements. Um, but it, could, it can definitely be a variety of people so if it's something you're interested in then you can reach out to your local OVR office mm -hmm. to review that agreement see if you can fit 
see if you fit that definition, um, and then fill out the provider agreement. And then my final question is about the documentation of those services. Mm -hmm. Is there a formal document that is remitted uh, with release of information that the following services have been provided? Um, that's going to be all in that provider agreement. It spells out kind of how we keep track of all of that and what's required of our providers. So yeah, we do keep electronic records of services. Mm -hmm. Uh, with, with any services that have been provided through a staff or through a provider um, or through, um, you may, be, may have heard about our innovation and expansion contracts. We do have records of all of the services that have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, there are ways to look that information up for any student that's participated. Um, I'm a project search instructor. And so if my students that are coming in, well, this year they've all under OVR, but as I evaluate them in the fall, for the following year, if they're on the wait list, how does that affect them? We're working on guidance um, for that, but um, it is for the 2019-2000 school year, they have to ha be in plan status in order to be able to um, be able to follow through with project search for the 2019-2020 school year. So you're... Right, we're working on... So right. my, yeah, my encouragement would be if you have any prospective students for the following school year, make sure they have a PETS service that they have, required, that they have received one of the required services before eligibility is determined and get on that wait list. So not knowing when the wait list is going to open up, that they hopefully can move forward before um, the applications and the interviews take place for the next school year. Um, the I use the oh she she asked the question are uh, I use and school districts able to pro to provide the, the PETS service yes there are there are sir, there are um, part, parts of the state there are providers that are um, school districts and um, I use they have that have provider agreements with us um, it does have to be uh, it has to be either an OVR paid for service or an OVR ser or provided by an OVR staff, but um, they are potentially providers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was the transition program sponsored by OVR? Okay, so she asked if the student was in a transition program prior, would that count? And I'm sorry, so repeat what you, you're clarifying? As a PETS. No. Would that count as a pre-employment transition service? No, not if OVR didn't sponsor it. So it is 145, so I did want to give out the code um, for those people that need it for credit. Um, so wait back up. And uh, again, I know there's more questions. We're going to be up front, so if you have any questions that didn't get answered, please feel free to come up. We also have our table downstairs. So...